welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the second part from the wonderful mind of Michael Lockhart. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Origin of Dogman Lacey by the Silvery Moon Part 2 Let's get straight into that Beautiful dreamer, wake unto me Starlight and dewdrops are waiting for thee Sounds of the rude world, heard in a day Lulled by the moonlight, will all pass away My latest rendition of the old standard tune ended abruptly as I heard a familiar rough and a low growl from just inside the trees. It was getting late and I decided that after a long afternoon of yard work, it would be nice to relax in the shadows of the forest. I'd also held out some hope that maybe my best friend might make an appearance and there she was. Preternaturally still, standing in the trunk of a large pine, she peeked around the bowl in a playful manner. Yet her eyes blazed red and her mouth gaped open in an awful grin, full of fangs and horror, and we were standing closer to one another, I knew, of a foul stench. I grinned back at her. Hey, sweet lady, I take it you're well? Her menacing grin widened, and she panted, a little in pleasure, at the greeting, as she stepped from behind the big pine and walked towards me. As she drew near, she dropped it all fours and nuzzled at my hand in a doggy greeting. And she gave out a little whine. Dogs know how to play people. And there was a hint in that sound as though she desperately needed to just have a scratch behind the ears and above the base of her tail to save her life. Drama queen. I said to the massive beast that had started life as a fluffy little puppy. My fluffy little puppy. Lacey. Yet I relented as we knew I would and provided the scratches. And she rose once more and gave me a quick dog kiss on the cheek. I had to choke back a gag at the odious wave of her breath. And then she stepped back and gave me her best goofy dog grin, mixed with the way her face had evolved into some more sinister features. You want to have some supper with me? I knew she wouldn't. Months after her final transformation, she preferred her own fresh kills, but it had become one of our games for me to ask. She surprised me, though, by getting a twinkle in her otherwise baleful eyes and nodding. Well... I have a pot roast in a crock. She turned and bounded back a little way into the tree line and dropped all fours again. She raced around through a few trees and popped out again and a little ways from me. A piece of wet, dripping dead critter in a moor. Ah, even as a dogman, Lacey had a great sense of humour. One just had to speak and understand the doggish language. Or is it maybe Doganese? I thought as we walked over to the back porch and the little patio set. Ah, it's amazing what we can adapt to and perceive as normal when we love those involved. I ate roast with some grilled veggies and Lacey chomped her raw red meat, still giving off a little steam. Poor Critter's temperature must have been up after running from my pooch lady. Miriam had to work late this evening or she would have joined us. Somebody had an injured cow or bull or something. Lacey stopped mid-chomp and looked at me, askance. Yeah, she said it may have been some coyotes or feral dogs. You have a different theory? I feared for a moment that she may have gone more feral than I expected. Nah, not Lacey. She actually understands what would happen if she fed on livestock. I thought, all too willing to give her a pass. She sat silently for a moment, clearly trying to think of a way to clearly communicate what she knew or believed she knew. And finally, she stretched her head down low and used her right foreclaw to point at her neck. The place where she had four pink scars from when the Lacey Albert werewolf bit her and started this journey. I leaned back into my patio chair. So you think it was another werewolf? At that she gave a little shrug. I was often surprised at how much she's picked up on human gestures. Maybe so many millennia of human and canine interaction had led to some cross-species non-verbal communication gestures. I read something on dogs actually understanding humans better than we realised. And besides, Lacey had already been exceptional at least in my perfectly unbiased view. 
<laughs> I roll. Not sure, huh? Just not coyotes or dogs? And she gave me a nod. Well, golly gee, lassie. Did little Timmy get bitten by that other lacy before he fell down the well and needed to be rescued? Her look was priceless. The sinister dogman features contorted in deep and genuine confusion. And she looked quite hideous, so naturally, I laughed. Well, I'm sorry, girl. Well, there was no way for you to get that reference. I just meant that it seems we may have another monster on our hands. And she resumed her normal, merely sinister grin, jaw gaping, gleaming fangs displayed, and a little drawl escaping from one side where her tongue lolled. I tell you what, I'm a get with Miriam and work on a who might be missing angle. And you? You, well, keep doing your thing. A few people know about you. I had to tell Sheriff Cloud so that if anyone sees you and freaks out, he can redirect. I told that nice lead paramedic too, and she needed to know about the toxic bites and the scratches. So, maybe the High Sheriff will have some information for us. Lacey had gulped down the remainder of her meal and clearly wanted to get back into the woods, and so we rose and I hugged and patted my enormous rescue shelter pup and rubbed her back. She tilted her head up a little and gave a little howl of pleasure, parting and sheer youthful exuberance. And then, in a flash, she swelled away and vanished into the darkness. We both had work to do. Valerie pulled out onto the highway from the parking lot of Pliny's Delight Package Store, fine wines, liquors and beer. She was en route back to her dead-end little hometown and would need the booze to numb her mind to the utter boredom that would ensue for the duration of her stay. She had come down for her brother's memorial service about six months before and was now back to sell their ancestral estate. She rolled her eyes. If you can call a three-bedroom, wood-frame house and half an acre an estate, still, it would sell eventually and she could use the income to pay off her town home in the big city. They'd cremated Philip before she arrived and the local yokels had been short of answers as what exactly had happened to him. Still, she had a few acquaintances, no real friends, but a few who might talk under the right circumstances. In complete privacy and confidence, or if there was something in it for them. And so far, all she knew was that her brother's trashy girlfriend had been responsible. Still, it didn't make sense. She thought for the upteenth time, as she made the nighttime drive towards the wide spot in the road that she called home until her 18th birthday. Her father had disappeared when she was nine, and in the intervening years, she'd lost her mother, and now her baby brother, Phil. Phil had been pretty smitten with Lacey Elbert. The girl had been pretty, but Valerie thought there was something wild about her, not in a party in sense, but rather something gamey. She decided a bit of the local wilderness had infected the young woman. And that's probably what Phil had liked. He had enjoyed the great outdoors, of which there was plenty in this area. The trees went on and on for miles. Mert! she exclaimed as her headlights lit up a large animal in front of a speeding jeep. And it ran across the road and scampered into some trees on the other side. If something so large could be said to have scampered. And she braked and swerved to avoid a collision and knew that it had cleared the roadway, but a thump sounded on her passenger side rear fender and caused her to swerve. Something large had struck her vehicle. Once she corrected the skid, she pressed her brakes and checked the mirrors. In the bright red of the brake lights, she saw an enormous hair-covered figure that stood in the middle of the highway in a menacing posture, arms akimbo, claws on display and ferocious maw wide open emitting a roar. She had slowed significantly, and as she started fixated on the horrific scene behind her, she nearly failed to note the return of the first figure and that it had darted in front of her. And this one was slightly less bulging, but had longer and wilder hair. It ran at her car from within the blackness of the nighttime forest, now on two legs. Instead of stomping, she smoothly pressed the accelerator to avoid the loping beast. It struck the driver's side fender and she heard the ear-splitting shriek of razor talons as they scraped the metal of a vehicle in an attempt to seize and stop the machine. And she continued to accelerate and saw in the mirror that both nightmares now chased her on all fours and were closing fast. She downshifted and pushed the engine to redline before gearing back up. It was a near thing but eventually, when she checked the mirrors, the duo 
had vanished into the gloom. She shook with fear and the effects of a massive adrenaline dump. She glanced around nervously, in fear that, at any minute, one or both of the bipedal lupine horrors would pounce from the murky shadows. And she slowly regained control of her breathing and in through her nose. Three counts, hold. Three counts, release. Three count. After three sets, she felt slightly more calm. She desperately wanted to stop and look at the damage her Jeep had surely sustained, but she didn't dare. Maybe it would be a good time to have a word with the local law enforcers. She'd need a police report for the insurance company, and she might be able to coax some information from them if she properly played the part of Demoiselle and de Atre. Deputy Barnum met her at the house to take her report. Valerie wasn't sure about how to describe the creatures that attacked her, and so she went for the simplest explanation, of which she had tried to convince herself during the drive to her little hometown, and people in outlandish costumes. She could tell that Deputy Barnum was sceptical. He worked very hard to project his disbelief. So, ma'am, you say you saw these people, maybe in costumes, maybe with large dogs, after you left the liquor store? She crossed her arms defensively and in frustration. For the fourth time, yes, I haven't had a drop and none of my containers are open. In fact, you can see that they fell from the front of my seat onto the floor. I haven't even cleaned out the car, nor got inside the house. I don't know who or what the beings were, but they were hairy and tall and hid my jeep hard enough to do that. She pointed at the large dent in the passenger side rear fender and the deep gouges along the driver's side. Deputy Barnum nodded. Yes, ma'am. I just want to get us straight for the record. And did you see any of them holding any instruments that could do that damage? Maybe an iron rake or a garden tool. Valerie chewed her lip. She really wanted to punch this backwards Sherlock and deal with the hounds of the backwardsville herself. Maybe, but there were no long handles. They could have carried some sort of claw and instrument. The interview went on for another 15 minutes or so and Deputy Barnum gave her some unsatisfying and unlikely assurances that the Sheriff's Department would look into the incident and that she could pick up a copy of the report the day after tomorrow. While it was good to have the incident recorded, she had the feeling that Barnum knew something more, but was hesitant to tell her. And well, she could at last mix that favourite drink. Mr. Ahrens from the bank brought in his dog Fritz and said that he saw a notice of foreclosure, about to be served on the Elbert Place. I thought old Kenny would have left it to his nephew and niece, Nancy and Drew. Ha! I don't think they could read much less solve mysteries. They live even further out in the sticks, though. Maybe they never found out about their inheritance, Miriam speculated as she reclined on the sofa. She'd had yet another long day, mainly backed up appointments from after her moo cow emergency. Well, I wondered who was left out of them, after Sheriff Cloud and the JP told me about the murders. Any idea if the boyfriend had any family? I didn't want to press her with the bigger questions, and she was tired. Oh yes, he was a local boy, but his daddy ran off when he was little and then his sister went off to college and work in a big city. Then his mum died. Sweet lady. His life was like a country song. I was a teenager, my daddy ran off and my mama died. I was smitten, then bitten by my werewolf girlfriend. She sang the last in a silly, twangy voice and tune. How's the cow? I asked innocently. If she was too tired, she'd give a short answer. If she felt like talking, then we could discuss it. Well, certainly not coyotes or even a cougar. The bite radius was huge. If we had bears, maybe something like a large wolf or dog. She trailed off and I could hear the question and the implication that Lacey could be the culprit. I knew that Miriam wouldn't want to believe it, but she, like me, had to know for sure. Well, it wasn't a certain... Dog girl, I asked her. She thinks there may be another werewolf. I must say I agree. One had to have infected the Elbert girl. I just don't know that much about werewolves. She looked pretty similar to my, our uh, Lacey. And they both went on four legs as often as two, but there was a different quality and some difference in shape. That were Lacey was tremendously spiteful to our uh, Lacey. 
definitely had a grudge about the first night. I think that Lacey must have gotten in the way of her hunt for a meal. Or maybe I'll ask her. Miriam chuckled. You are the only man I've ever heard who could hold a conversation with his dog. Those rescue pups are remarkable. Oh, and so are you. The rest of that evening is none of our business, but I had noticed that since I recovered from the werewolf scratches, I'd been feeling hmm, vigorous. My aches and pains all but forgotten. I sat across from Sheriff Jim Cloud in his office, and we each sipped a cup of very good coffee. Apparently, over his years in law enforcement, old Jean had become a connoisseur de café. We'd come to the end of pleasantries and small talk, and he got around to the point. Well, I hate to ask, but do you think that a uh, dog of yours, um, do you think she may have anything to do with the attack on the steer? Thing is, the bite and claw marks would be consistent with, well, you know, a creature of her size and configuration. Jean and I had become friends since the night we caught the howling incident, after that old werewolf movie from the 80s, and so I could understand why he was hesitant to ask. I think that he really didn't want it to be Lacey, either. Well, this would sound weird to anyone else, but you've seen some things. I asked her, and it was my turn to be hesitant, and she denies it. Thinks it may be another werewolf. Jean nodded. Oddly, the fact that you talk about your transmogrified pooch is not what concerns me. However, I've worked with enough teens and young adults to know that they sometimes come up with convenient and usually imaginary culprits to redirect attention from their behaviours to other parties. It's not that they're being bad, it's a pretty normal type of psychological avoidance. They don't want to hurt or disappoint a respected figure in their lives, and they don't want to process the guilt they feel. I shook my head. Lacey studied life as a dog. She doesn't really know how to lie. I haven't taught her, and so now I believe her. I know how parents are about defending their kids, and they'll employ all sorts of mental gymnastics to avoid acknowledging the poor behaviour of their brats. You know, Mr. Master of Science, denial. I smiled at the last. To ensure he knew that I was teasing, I actually respected his formal education. I had been right about the concept of avoidance. Lacey was pretty young still. Nah, I couldn't start doubting her. She was a good girl. We discussed the possibilities of other wildlife that could have been involved, or even humans. In the end, the Lord High Sheriff of the county decided that it would remain a mystery. He put animal predation on the report so the owner could file an insurance claim for the loss. I think he still may have suspected Lacey, but he let it go, mainly because there was no real evidence but also because he was a country sheriff and we were friends. Always easier to believe the reality we want, Mr. Sank Major. Benny Diaz had had a long day, and this last service had been the worst. It had taken him two hours to find the manufactured home on its quarter-acre plot. Why can't they just call them trailers? Hide in the wheels and had him fake shutters doesn't change anything. He thought with a distaste. It doesn't matter. I'll be home soon and enjoying Donetsk's fine cooking. Now, he needed to ensure that no feral animals or humans had taken up a residence in or around the trailer or the little shed to one side before he risked an approach up to the raised porch and knocked on the front door. And per policy, he knocked on the door and called out his name and company and that he was there to serve process. No answer. No surprise. He checked the windows and saw that the lights were out. He was pretty sure that the power had been cut off already. He posted a notice on the door that gave warning that the mortgage payments of one Kenneth Albert were in arrears and that a foreclosure process would begin in 60 days. And there was more to the initial notice and the bank had added the names of the co-beneficiaries of Kenneth Albert's last will and testament. His twin niece and nephew Nancy and Drew Albert. Done. Now for home. He didn't get to finish the thought, as suddenly he found himself airborne and flying through the raised porch at the front door. The earth rose up to meet him, and he felt some of his ribs on his left side snap. Some on the right may have been snapped as well, but the shredded flesh above them stung, burned, and hurt too much for him to be sure. He attempted to choke in a breath, in genuine misery, 
when a set of jaws clamped onto the back of his neck and the beast that had been Drew Elbert shook him like a terrier shakes rats. His neck snapped just like a rodent. His final thought was of Donata's fine cooking. Now he'd be on the receiving end of supper. Valerie drove up to the trailer where her erstwhile soon-to-be sister-in-law and parents had lived. Where the parents and her brother had died. It wasn't a terrible place. It was a fairly recent model of manufactured home. And Phil had helped Kenny Elbert build that really nice, if very tall, porch. The whole place sat on a slight slope that left the front entrance higher off the ground than the back door entrance. She'd never been here as a child or teen. And Lacey Elbert was younger than both she and her brother. And so, there was no need to go out of the way. The place looked empty though, despite the newer car model parked in the driveway and had that quality of silence that speaks of lingering abandonment. Even the air smelled of. <sighs> she exclaimed as she retched and the acid rose into her chest and burned uncomfortably. The smell out in the yard was foul, blood, opened bowels and the early stages of decay. Something had clearly expired in a violent manner nearby. Something large. There it was. A mass of dried gore, lumps of flesh and some scattered broken bones. The rounded mound of a skull protruded from the middle. A human skull! She realised in consternation. She scrambled for her phone and dialed the emergency number and darted her gaze around to scan for danger. Likely long gone, but she didn't want to take the chances. The nearest neighbours had property lines that ran up near the home, but the houses and mobiles were far enough from this one that everyone had at least the illusion of privacy and... There were screens of brush on the front and back property lines of the trailer, and that meant there were likely no eyes on her. However, she walked back to her jeep and stood by the driver's door. The signal was pretty weak, and so she didn't want to risk losing it by getting inside the metal box on wheels. And besides, she'd seen too many horror movies where people jumped into the cars to be safe, and then wham, the monster or whatever got them. The dispatcher finally answered and asked for the nature of her emergency. She gave her location and said that she had found some human remains. No, fresh remains. The blood looks dried, but I didn't want to go near the thing. It's grotesque. The operator assured her that deputies and the ambulance were on their way and she should remain calm and stay on the line. Valerie rolled her eyes and thought, uncharitably, if I have to keep conversing with you, cousin Ellie May, I will lose it. She pretended to have signal issues and then dropped the call. She looked around nervously. She knew that it would take time for help to arrive, and she warily watched a wood line on the north side of the property. Any creepy callers would come from that direction. And she was startled, an adrenaline shock washed through her body when a double tap of the small car horn sounded sharply from behind her. Mad! I'm tired of these jump scares! She shouted internally as she turned to face the roadway. A small car that had seen better days long ago sat rattling and rumbling on the driveway entrance, but still facing down the road, likely a neighbour. Howdy, you looking for the Alberts? A youngish man in a ball cap asked as he leaned his elbow on the open window. Valerie eyed him. She knew enough about the people in the area to understand that he was likely just trying to help and was only a little nosy. Actually, I know what happened to them. My brother Philip was dating Lacey. I just came to see because of what happened. He nodded. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm in the next house up this way with my folks. I met Phil. He sure was nice. I'm sorry about your loss. You just had that look about you that said you might be in need of help. And Valerie nodded. Well, actually, I just got off the phone with the sheriff's department dispatch. There are human remains over there on the far side of the porch. A real mess. Would you mind staying here with me until they arrive? It should only be a few minutes. The young man hesitated just a moment to process what he had just heard, and then nodded. He moved his car so that it would not block the driveway, and then parked it and got out to approach Valerie. Sean Mason, he said as he extended his hand for a shake. Val le Fouvre, she responded. I grew up around here, but have been gone for a few years. Yeah, I remember Phil said something about a big sister and the big city. So where? At that point, the breeze shifted and the smell registered, and he blanched and stepped backwards and waved his hand frantically as though fending off an assault on his nostrils. 
and despite her stress level, Valerie had to suppress a laugh at the look on his face. Yet Sean seemed to handle it well. He recovered his composure and walked a little closer to the pile that had once been a person. I wouldn't get too close, Valerie warned. He or she, who can tell, is beyond first aid and the cops will likely want to look for evidence. Wouldn't want to mess up the crime scene. He nodded and halted his forward progress but stared. I don't know, but I think it's a guy. Well, that's a tie near the skull. Maybe just blood spatter, but I think it's an ugly tie. Shortly, the wail of sirens sounded in the distance, and the cavalry arrived to save the day. It was late afternoon, and getting on towards the end of the day before they released Valerie from the scene. They cut John loose within an hour, and he had to get to work with the plant. And Valerie, who was a relative stranger, and who had filed a recent suspicious report, well, she had to remain on the foul-smelling scene. The deputies had finished speaking with her and asked her to wait, and then had gotten busy. She hung out with the nice lead paramedic, Julie, while the techs processed the scene and waited for the sheriff and the JP to arrive. She and Julie could hear their snippets of the conversations they had. Same as the street the other day. Had to be big, just like that one. Brooks. Footprints. Woods. Valerie jumped a little when Julie spoke. <sighs> we had a scene like this a while back. Well, a little different, but just as messy. Over at the Brooks house, used to be the Lee family's place. She looked at Val to see if there was a hint of recognition. Yes, I know where the Lees lived. I went to school with one of their daughters. Who were the Brooks? Julie shrugged. Just one, Mr. Brooks, an older man and his dog. Well, I guess they'd both be Brooks. She laughed a little at that, and it seemed to Val that only Julie knew why that was funny. He'd just have to shoot Lacey Elbert. You may have heard the rumours about that or seen the one news report. He had a nasty scratch on his arm. From some wild person or a critter, something big. She raised her chin towards the scene and Val followed her gaze, quickly lost in thought. Within the hedge and the brush of the property boundary squatted two unnaturally still figures, each with its large ears turned towards what the human said. They were pleased that it had not taken long to draw attention after they took out the human that was taking away the home that Uncle Kenny had meant for them. And they soon knew that the Valerie human was related to Cousin Lacey's boyfriend. Lacey had probably not intended to kill him. And Drew listened carefully to what the female said and Nancy focused on the conversation of the humans who worked around what they called the scene. And they shortly had the information they'd sought for some time. An old man and his dog had attacked their cousin and killed her. And now they knew where he lived. Brooks, the old Lee place. Deputy Barnum made it to the scene of the Elbert residence near the beginning of his shift, just in time to meet with the clean-up crew assigned to pick up the corpse. They worked by the stand lights and the headlights of the car since it was past nightfall. And he would only have to be on site for a short time. Hey fellas, you need help with anything? Nah, we got it, Barnum. Look out for the smell. Still some left. One of the techs advised him. Nowhere near as bad as that Elba chick, but still pretty ripe. A deep, throated, angry growl arose from just within the wood line. It was quickly followed by a slightly higher pitch one, and then some scuffling noises and the breaking of branches as large bodies moved more deeply into the forest. Barnum looked up startled, and the two remaining techs whipped their heads towards the trees. There was no sign that anything was there, and only the movement of a few small branches indicated that anyone or anything had just been out of sight, observing. I'm going to the trunk to get my rifle, uh, just in case, Barnum informed the others. As his trunk lid squealed open, and he reached for his AR platform rifle, a deep octave roar arose from within the woods, quickly joined by a howl of anger, frustration and grief. The reverberation sent cold shivers up Barnum's spine, and the two techs finished up quickly. He was very happy when they cleared the scene, and didn't envy the Sheriff Cloud and Justice Jenny Fior, who still had to notify the widow. And despite the mess of the body, they had quickly identified the victim by his license plates, what was left of his face, and the driver's license in his wallet. It was only on his way back to the more settled areas where he normally patrolled, that Barnum thought about the report that Valerie de Foudre had made. 
It sounded like what she had described, giant wolves that could run on two legs or four. I awakened at 4.44 exactly, according to my phone. I felt like I'd heard something. The air condition must have been running hard as it felt cold in a bedroom, even with Miriam's warm body beside me. I lay there and listened and thought about getting up to adjust the thermostat, but I really didn't want to. I wanted to sleep. I just started to drift off to a dreamland when I shot up at the sound of a deep-throated howl that emerged from the woods behind the house. That's not lacy, I thought. Sounds like two or more. Sounds more like that, that other lacy. Miriam, accustomed to arising quickly for emergencies, stirred and asked why Lacey had come to visit so early and why she felt the need to make so much noise. She apparently hadn't fully awakened. It's all right, love. Sleep on. I'll take a look. I crept down the stairs, shotgun in one hand, handheld spotlight in the other. I was ready in case of another werewolf attack. Once you've experienced one, you will never feel completely safe. At least I hadn't when I reached for the front door. I shuddered. The sounds I'd heard the night I had killed, Lacey Elbert, had returned. The heavy treads on the front porch, the scratching and rattling at the door. I clicked off the safety and prepared to blast away through the front portal to my home once again. When I heard a different howl cut through the gloom of the night outside. Lacey's howl. Once more, my girl and I would face the danger side by side. I knew she would be there to help. Her sound had come from very close to the house, and I couldn't risk a blind shot through the door. I shifted over to one of the windows on either side of the door. I hung the handle with a big light on my thumb and used the rest of my fingers to grasp the curtain and pull it aside. My already pounding pulse skipped ahead several beats when I saw what the dim exterior lights displayed. The face was a close match for the one I'd seen in the woods after it attacked Lacey and then again when Lacey Elbert had burst through my front door in animal fury. The beast snarled at me through the glass but quickly looked over its shoulder. Another, even larger creature stood beside it, facing full on into the front yard, lit by the gibbous moon. Both creatures spied something just out of my vision, a shadowy figure with glowing red eyes. Lacey was here to help. I had to back her. Both monsters leapt from the porch and moved incredibly swiftly towards my girl. I ran to the front door and flung it open, heedless of any threat they may pose. I had taken one of the werewolves down with a 12 gauge. I could handle two. The situation evolved quickly out of my control as Lacey bounded away into the trees and the others in hot pursuit. And the big one stopped and then looked back at me when I stepped out onto the porch and screamed, Stop! You leave her alone, bastards! It hesitated and was lost, and I was able to hit it with at least a few pellets of buckshot. The blast set my ears ringing, and the impact set the beast to a snarling after a startled yelp of pain and surprise. I used a recoil to pump in the next round, a slug, but there was nothing ahead of me but darkness. I stepped back inside to retrieve the spotlight I dropped when I saw that ghastly face at my window. I shone it into the woods, I could find nothing. I heard a hunting howl drift through the trunks and limbs, and then some other sounds, almost like barks and snarls, but they faded into the night. I had no way to track them or to help my Lacey. I called Sheriff Cloud on his cell phone. I was one of a handful of people outside the department who had that number. His exhausted voice answered, oh, Sheriff Cloud, what's the emergency? Sheriff, it's me, Earl. And two werewolves just attacked Lacey. They chased her into the woods. I shot one, but I don't think I heard it. Or not badly. Will you come over and help? As soon as it's light, I want to go out and look. Slow down, Earl. Let me get fully awake. We've had a bad scene earlier today at the old Albert place. I've only had a few hours of sleep, so I'm groggy. Eventually, I gave him a clear report and reminded him that, with what was involved, he'd instructed me to call him directly. He said that he and a couple of his deputies would be on scene at first light, with tracking dogs. I thanked him, and looked over to see a set of concerned features watching me from just inside the kitchen. And then I noticed the enticing smell of coffee. Miriam. True to his word, just as the first rays of the sun penetrated the forest tops, 
Sheriff Jean Cloud arrived. He had a tired looking Barnum and another deputy with him. As they unloaded, a pickup arrived with two baying hounds in the back, the tracker. I felt better immediately. Lacey hadn't returned and I had been worried sick about her. What had those monsters done? Could she handle them by herself? Or maybe the smaller one. She looked a little flabby for a monster, but that big one, the one that had a beer gut along with his massive chest and shoulders, he'd give her problems if he could catch her. We got through the greetings and introductions quickly. I showed Jean where the creatures had left behind, muddy foot, paw, whatever prints on my porch I had left claw marks on the door frame. I pointed over to where the tracks led between the bowls. I didn't want to walk over there. I thought it might mess up the dog's scent. But I must have hit it, and there's a nice splash of blood and drops leading into the woods. The tracker brought over the two hounds, but he had to all but drag them to the bloodstained grass. They whined and tugged at their leads, more interested in hopping back into the bed of his pickup than into tracking brutes. Eventually, despite the tug of war and curses from the handler, they tucked their tails and lay down submissively. They refused to move, heads tucked low to the ground. I just can't understand it, Sheriff. I've never seen him act like this. Well, he glanced at me. That one time. Sheriff Cloud nodded. Ah, it's okay. Oh knows about the Elbert case. I was afraid of this. Oh, canines won't track these things. You're absolutely sure that they chased Lacey? She wasn't with them? I had to choke back my anger. Of course I'm sure. They chased her away from her own home and into the dark. I'm sure I heard a fight out deep in those woods. The tracker put up his obviously relieved hounds and took out a large caliber rifle. The sheriff and deputies already had AR style rifles and I still had my shotgun. We rallied and set off, and the tracker in front to follow the blood trail. We didn't really need hounds for the first hundred yards or so, and then the blood dried up. The heavy layers of pine straw were hard to read, but something with large feet had shifted them enough to show the wet mass underneath the dry top layers. It took a while, but we eventually found the space where Lacey had made her last stand. I looked around in fear, the forest seemed to close in around us, and there was a fallen hardwood tree with the root system still intact and set up several feet from the ground. It would have covered her back nicely, my clever girl, I thought, still worried but equally proud. No obvious bodies, I contributed to the professional conversation that had occurred while I was sunk in reverie. Still some blood. The tracker pointed out the wine red splatters on the leaves and the roots of the fallen forest giant. Big fight, lots of scuffs, at least two, maybe, yep, three from the track sizes. More dirt to make prints, sure was a scrap and it kind of stinks still, like with that Albert thing. Can you tell where they went afterwards? I asked a little frantically. He shrugged. Ah, looks like one went off deeper into the woods, the other two went off that way. The big one and the other, almost headed towards town. He looked towards Sheriff Cloud and shrugged again, as if to say, it's up to you, Sheriff. Gene made a call to his day shift supervisor and to dispatch, and they were to alert him directly of any reports of large animal sightings or attacks. I desperately wanted to follow what I was sure was Lacey's trail, but Gene convinced me to stay with the group and follow the killers, the true threat. Along the way, he told me about the scene of the Elbert's place the previous day, of how vicious it was and how little was left of Benny Diaz. They weren't just monstrosities, they were human killers and eaters. We followed the trail for a couple of miles before we hit a patch of wetland marsh. Not a true swamp, but just a low area that held water and the blackened remains of fallen trees and old stumps that had rotted in the muck and mass. Without dogs to sniff away, we lost their trail. We backtraced to my place and everybody went about their day and their business. I thanked Jean and the others profusely and assured them that I would stay alert. And before he left, Jean pulled me aside. Well, I'm violating some laws and my own policies, I'm sure, but take this. He handed me a metal cylinder with a ring and a pin handle at one end. If they get on your porch again, it will sting them with a rubber pellet and soak them with pepper spray. 
It won't stop him, but it may give you enough time to get a clean shot. Just pull the ring. Make sure it's all the way out and toss it. Best to toss it from around the corner. And look, they seem to have an interest in your place or in Lacey. Maybe both. The other scene was out of town, different direction, but it was unlikely just a coincidence that it occurred at the Albert Place. A young local, well, she moved away, but she's back visiting. Saw two enormous man beasts. Claims they attacked her and her jeep while she was driving out onto the main highway. Her brother was Lacey Albert's boyfriend, and she's the one who found Benny's remains. Something weird is going on here, and it's all connected. Please, be safe and keep your shotgun handy. I'm going to set up a deputy on your place at night. They'll still have to take calls, but you'll have someone watching from close by most of the time. I'm doing the same for Miss Lefouvre. And With that, we said our goodbyes. Take cares and wish you well. It was a very good thing that he'd told me about Valérie Lefouvre since she had showed up on my front porch that afternoon. She dropped Julie the paramedic's name as a means of introduction and to explain how she had found me. I'd been out back, anxiously hoping that Lacey would make an appearance. Miriam, Dr. Stone, had gone to work at her office but remained on standby for emergency house calls. We touched bases throughout the day by text. I had done what little I could to take care of my no longer so little pup. I invited Valerie to join me in my visual, though I didn't tell her that that's what I was doing. She turned out to be a fan of my iced tea, and we each held a glass and pondered the forest of fear that spread before us. So, I understand that you had a little adventure on your way into town? I asked after we spent a little time talking about everything but what we both wanted to. Yes, sir. I know it sounds strange, but I promise I wasn't drinking and I don't do any drugs. As far as I know, I have no mental health challenges. Yet I was attacked by two, well, werewolves. She stopped and looked at me to see if I disagreed or get angry or dismissive. It had to have been difficult for her to tell the story in the first place and now have to repeat it. As of last night, I'd seen them too, I assured her. I saw another like them several months ago. It attacked me and I shot it. It turned out to be Lacey Albert. I hesitated, but she needed to know. It also attacked my dog, little Lacey, and she was just leaving puppyhood. The attack, a bite on the scruff of her neck, led to some changes. She looks a lot like one of the wares, but uh, cleaner, not scruffy, and her joints are still like a dog's rather than a human's. A uh, reverse werewolf, if you will. Like the way a person turns part way into a wolf, and so a dog, close relative of the wolf, turns part way into a human. She was smart. I liked her. Ah, you got it in one. Only with Lacey, she already thought she was a human girl. The daughter my Rhonda and I never had. I must have gone wistful at that, and we sat together in silence for a moment. She leapt to her feet. Get the gun! She called excitedly and pointed towards the woods. I saw the outline before I saw her poor, sweet face. The pointed ears near the top of her head gave away her identity instantly. And besides, she was my girl. I'd know her anywhere. It's okay. We're safe, I told Valerie. That's Lacey. She's just shy because she doesn't know you. If you like, stand back inside the house, but I can promise you, you are safer with her than me. You are 100% safe with me. Not exactly eloquent, but my nerves were taut, and I was concerned for Lacey. Valerie remained beside me on the porch, smart and brave. I like her even more, I decided. I called out to my dog, go. It's okay, Lacey. Val's a friend. She knows. Come on up. I know it's still light, but we have to take a look. I'll call Miriam to come up and help. I looked on in shock as Lacey limped into the yard on all threes. She held up her left rear leg and avoided putting weight on it. I was swollen and the flesh on her thigh was torn, clearly raked with talons. There was what looked like a bite mark on her face. She had several smaller wounds, but I wanted to get her inside and stable. I helped her as best I could to clamber up the stairs and into the living room. I soon had her stretched out on the couch with a clean towel pressed against her bleeding face. Poor Val looked on at first in horror, 
and then in fascination as I brought my best friend into the house. I must admit, she took it better than I would have. She even helped Lacey navigate the stairs, a being that will be well over six feet in height standing, with ferocious fangs and a sinister gaping mouth long with solid claws. A monster, a real-life monster, but tame. Not quite, but funny enough. I called Miriam, and it turned out she was already on the way. There were no afternoon appointments, and so she decided to come on over to comfort me while we waited for Lacey to emerge from the depths of the endless trees. She bustled in and knelt by my sweet dog. Well, dog man, dog girl, you know what I mean. The one with a hideously foul breath that was diametrically opposed to her sweet disposition. Ah, oh, poor baby. I know it hurts. I'll get you a nice shot for the pain. And well, we'll get these boo-boos cleaned and stitched. Knowing you... You'll be healed by bedtime. Lacey licked her face in gratitude, and Dr. Stone withstood the torrent of stanchion drawl and got down to business. Nancy paced and fretted over her brother, who lay panting on the floor of the old tumble-down barn they'd found after the fight the previous night. She held her right forepaw inside her left to nurse the painful but rapidly healing injury to her wrist, and wore a few bite marks up and near the right side of her neck, if Drew hadn't come along, wounded or not, it would have been a very close fight with that little bitch. Before they'd been ordered, she and Drew had a dog that had a litter of puppies. No one wanted the runt, and so she and Drew had taken her up to the store in town and dumped her out behind it. Along the way, they'd kicked her and thrown things at her. All in fun, of course. No serious harm done. Nothing that the shelter people couldn't fix. They'd put a collar made of a zip tie and with a cardboard tag dangling from it that proclaimed her name was Lacey. It was a way to tease their favourite cousin, Lacey. Also a runt, all in fun, of course. Now the bitch had been transformed as well into something Nancy had never imagined. They had also found the Brooks, the man-creature who slaughtered their cousin. And he was more of a danger than either of them had thought. Before and after transformation, Nancy had possessed a rare temper a nasty disposition. Only her brother Drew and cousin Lacey could tolerate her company, and now Lacey was dead and her brother wounded at the hands of that, that Brooks. Drew groaned. In addition to the shotgun pellets that were slowly pushed out through the entrance points in his flesh, or wrapped up in fleshy nodules, he had four gashes from claws that had raked across his face and taken out his right eye. That would not heal for days, maybe never. The open wounds they had taken from that lacy pup did not heal as quickly as those taken from mundane sources. Oh, that bitch. My poor Lacey healed more quickly than I would have, but not at a supernatural pace as when she'd first been bitten. It was most of a week before she was able to put substantial weight on her rear legs. She still seemed to favour going on all fours for the time being, yet some wag had returned to her butt and tail and she gave many more of her effluvient but radiant smiles. She and Val headed off and became instant friends. I found out that Valerie had been staying in her old family home, all alone, and after I checked with Miriam, we offered her my spare room. That helped the sheriff's deputies tremendously. Only one place to watch. I had a house full of women, and it was a little odd for me, but they were all intelligent, brave, and strong, and so it was enjoyable, except for the choices on what shows to watch. On the night of day four, I sat up in my recliner. I had the latest watch on Lacey. In the distance, I heard the howls of a successful hunt. By the morning of day five, I chalked it up to a nightmare. And Dr. Stone, she was the only Miriam at home, had left for the office and the girls had flopped on the sofa to watch some daytime TV drivel. I heard an SUV pull into the driveway and up to the front porch. It was Sheriff Cloud. I met him on the front porch and he got right down to business. Oh... Has Lacey been here with you since she returned? Well, of course. She hasn't been able to leave. She's no longer hobbling, but she's not yet fully healed. Uh, she's been sleeping on the couch, and Dr. Stone, Valerie, or I have stayed in a recliner, in shifts to keep an eye on her. Uh, what's up? I knew it was something bad. He wore that look, and unfortunately, I was right. Uh, one of my deputies, Peter Barnum, you may remember him from the hunt the other day. I nodded. 
Uh, he was attacked last night and mauled pretty badly. He took a call on a livestock mutilation at the Leonard Place up the road from you. Another steer killed and mostly eaten. I was on my way and the other deputy on duty wrapped up her DWI case and headed to him. <sighs> the werewolves, they got there first. Maybe they healed faster than Dogman. He shook his head. I still can't believe I can say that with a mostly straight face. Anyway, Barnum was critical. He's in the county hospital, but once he's stable, he's getting a helicopter ride to the city for trauma response. Oh, that's awful. Pete and I have shared a few cups of coffee when he had watched Judy. Seems like a good man, I said helplessly. Is there anything we can do to help him or his family? Gene shook his head. He looked exhausted. No, thanks though. I'm sure we'll put together something, but for right now we need to find the killers and put a stop to this. I'm going to kick it up to the state game warden's office, so maybe it will be a good idea to keep Lacey indoors. Maybe even upstairs for a while. She probably won't like that, but the game wardens may want to visit. And he rubbed the back of his neck in embarrassment. Oh, come on, Sheriff. You know we'll do what's needed. Yet there's something we've been putting off for too long. I'd like to introduce you to my girl. At that, I stepped aside and Lacey made her way onto the front porch. She was on all fours and still her back reached just above my waistline. Hey, darling girl. I greeted her. This is my... Uh, this is our friend, Sheriff Jean Cloud. Lacey walked carefully down the stairs and at the foot of them rose to her hind legs. She matched Jean's six foot four height and looked him in the eye, all the while wearing that terrifying, lolling grin that showed her fangs to such a great effect. I could see that it took every ounce of his considerable self-control to avoid stepping back and running for his life. <sighs> How do you know, Miss Lacey? He finally squeaked out of his tight throat. Her grin widened as she puffed out a breath of her wretched worth breath directly into his face. She nodded and extended her right forepaw, hand, somewhere in between. Okay? Again, our sheriff met the challenge and did not toss his cookies as the wretched odour struck him. He simply smiled and shook her. Let's say hand. Pleased to finally meet you. I heard so much about you. At this, he studied her closely and took that step away, not in terror, but to get a better view. He looked at me, and then back to her. No doubt about it. I could see how Lacey could be the culprit, but based on her descriptions, she's clearly not. The werewolves are described as flabby or even fat. Lacey here is trim and lean. Her ears are finer and set higher on her head, and her joints look like a canine. The others were reported as anthropomorphic, human-shaped. He explained for Lacey, who'd given him a brief, puzzled look. I can't believe how well she... Uh, you understand us, Lacey. You truly are a bright uh, lady. He had much to do. Apparently Deputy Barnum had disappeared from the hospital. And while the city had jurisdiction on the hunt for him, Jean had to keep Pete's wife and kids as calm as possible and look out for their well-being. He admonished us all to stay safe and assured us that he would try to have us meet the game wardens at his office. It was a little over 30 miles, but worth the drive if we could keep the potentially unfriendly eyes of my pooch person. After a week, Lacey was not only healed, she was cagey. Warmed up meat wasn't enough for her, she wanted to hunt. It was afternoon when the sheriff called and asked Valerie and I to come by his office and meet with the investigator from the game warden's office. Lacey remained on the porch, flopped out in the sun that slanted onto the roof and looking all too bored. Bored adolescents often get up to trouble, but she seemed to understand that the need to stay out of the woods until the situation was cleared up. Valerie and I told our stories once again, though I left out Lacey's transformation issues. We had decided to leave the story a little vague as to whether the creatures we'd seen and that had attacked us had been beasts or people. And since he was a game warden, we leaned towards large canine or lupine animals, and he assured us that there was no wolves locally at least none that large, but perhaps it had been a large breed of dog or a wolf-dog hybrid. We thanked him and left the sheriff's office as evening approached. We decided to get some supper in a little city that was our county seat. Not like I go out much and Valerie was accustomed to more variety than she had for the past week. We got home just after dark and as it turned out, 
just in the nick of time. Lacey was absent from her perch, no surprise, likely inside watching her news. Miriam's car was in the driveway. I had brought them both treats, and so I expected warm greetings, and then I noticed that the front door was ajar, and there were tremendous gouges around the metal-enforced frame. Vad and I looked at one another. Cold Jean, I threw over my shoulder as I raced towards the front entrance of my house. The bag that contained the food and other items dropped carelessly in my wake. As I reached the top of the stairs, I noticed a large, blurry, fuzzy mass in my peripheral vision. And as I was swept off my feet and almost tackled, a rough clawed hand covered my mouth, and the explanatives that would surely have burst forth. It was Lacey. She relaxed her hand and looked hard at me, and then towards the entrance to the house. She flicked her chin upward and then stalked forwards, off the edge of the porch. She looked over her shoulders as if she expected me to follow, and I did. I looked back at Val and signed for her to get in the truck and stay there. I was sure she was smart enough to turn on the engine and be ready to flee, if necessary. And she was on the phone, talking excitedly. Good. I padded along behind Lacey, who, though more massive than me, walked more quietly, almost in silence. We arrived at a back porch and she pointed towards the back door. We crept up to it and then I peered in through the kitchen window. I saw nothing unusual, nothing disturbed until I looked beyond into the living room. It was a mess. Everything was scattered. The barrel of my shotgun peeked out from between the rooms, near where it normally leaned on the wall. Lacey put up a hand to keep me in place and then slowly and quietly sneaked through the back door. And she fetched, sorry, I couldn't resist the shotgun carefully and brought it to me. We entered the house and made our way to the foot of the stairs. As we stepped closely and slowly and carefully, we heard creaks in the floorboards above our heads. Lacey clearly smelled something she didn't like. Wait, if she could smell them, they could smell us. I realised frantically, Lacey was ahead of me and had crouched just out of sight of the stairs. I raised the shotgun and pointed the business end towards the foot of the stairs. I heard a pair of thumps from something heavy that struck the upstairs floorboards and then a tremendous crunch as the enormous figure of the werewolf drew, Albert landed on the foot of my stairs. He jumped the entire length. He pivoted towards us, and I blasted him with a three-inch slug directly in his chest. Lacey had known to wait for me to do that. As soon as the heavy projectile struck him, Lacey leapt, confident that I would have her back. She expected the other beast to jump on her from behind, and she was mostly right. From upstairs, there was a slight crumpling noise, followed by immediately... A roar of rage and pain that burst forth and resounded throughout the structure. I heard a feminine voice shout, You like that bitch? When you are a part animal, you don't mess with a vet. Miriam! She used a grenade. She would need immediate help. I raced up the stairs in time to see Nancy Elbert Werewolf ripping through my bedroom door, splinters flying in all directions. I caught up to her as she stepped through into the room. I fired once and grazed her along her back, between the cacophony of the hound versus the wolf fight downstairs and the screaming of the big bad bitch in front of me and the shotgun rounds, I was all but deaf with tinnitus. And then I began to cough and my eyes watered from the remnants of the pepper spray. Nancy shrugged off the light wound on her back and stepped forward into the room, still intent on her prey. Perhaps she meant to hold Miriam as a hostage or to hurt her to torment me. Miriam had dived at the other side of the bed and pulled the heavy mattress over just a little to shield herself. It meant that I had a clear lane of fire, and so I did. I pumped two more rounds into the Nancy monster's back, and then, as she spun around, claws outstretched, I put one into her face, into her left eye. There was a satisfying spray of chunks and mist from behind her head as she dropped like a pile of crap she was. I raced over to Miriam, peeking from the corner of the mattress. I pulled her to her feet and embraced her briefly, and then I remembered. Lacey! I clawed open the bedside drawer and fumbled out two more rifled slugs. I had placed stashes of the things all over the house after the howling incident. At the top of the stairs, I paused and I realised that I no longer heard crashing and splintering or the roaring and snarling of the monster dogfight on the first floor. I descended slowly and looked cautiously around as far as I could see. 
Sharp cracks of rapid rifle reports further punished my ears, and they were followed quickly by the roars of a large caliber pistol. And after about a dozen rounds, the blasts of the sounds were followed by silence. Or perhaps I'd completely lost my hearing. I called out, I'm coming down and I'm carrying my shotgun. Don't shoot, please. At the bottom of the stairs, I saw the sheriff's deputy lying supine on the floor, still grasping his pistol and breathing heavily in obvious shock and fear. And just above his head stood the sheriff himself, one Jean Cloud, panting just as heavily and still clutching his rifle. And before them, stretched out with a limp finality, lay the enormous corpse of the werewolf, Drew Albert. A blurry shadow occluded my eyesight for a moment, followed by a warm, wet tongue that lapped my face with slimy dog drool, along with a disgusting smell. Lacey! After he wrapped up with a game warden investigator, Sheriff Cloud had headed our way to check on the deputy assigned to watch my house, and Deputy Knox had been out on the call when Nancy and Drew arrived. Miriam said that she had felt sorry for Lacey and had sent her out to hunt after she arrived. Miriam had been upstairs when the Elberts arrived. She had hidden and they quickly cornered her in the bedroom, yet they had an attack immediately. They had clearly planned a trap. Val's call had received immediate priority and the entire mess converged and took place in the Battle of the Brooks place. The house was cleaned once more and I had to answer awkward questions from my insurance agent about the continued assaults on my front door. Lacey was healing from her fresh wounds and she developed an impressive array of scars and she'd be holding her own with Drew, despite his enormous size. Now, apparently, fat werewolves lacked endurance and a 12-gauge slug through one of the lungs didn't help it. Sheriff Cloud had fended off the game warden's office with some convincing photos. The investigator hadn't given the case much credence in the first place, and so he was happy to clear it. Now Jean sat on my back porch, next to a glass of my famous iced tea, and scratched Lacey behind the ears. Uh, you sure would make a fine canine officer, Miss Lacey. If you ever decide you want a career in law enforcement... She grinned up at him, and he waved his hand in front of his nose. But we'll have to discuss our policy on oral hygiene, young lady. Deputy Knox was there, and he was still a little shy of Lacey, but he was happy enough to talk with Val and Julie. And sometimes it was interesting to have a spare woman at a gathering. Valerie had sold her family home. And she'd soon be leaving, but we assured her that she'd always be welcome to visit. I finally got to meet Miriam's daughter and grandson. And both women were divorced, but Jacob, Teresa's son, was a nice kid and we hit it off. He couldn't take his eyes off of Lacey, or Val, or Julie's, he was after all 13. Miriam and I had decided that we would all need to know the story since we were a family. She was all but moved into my house, and so we had plenty to discuss. Later that evening, as the sun went down, I sang my old song to Miriam and tried to fight off a troubling thought. No one had yet found a sign of Peter Barnum. He had apparently dropped off the face of the earth. It was over a hundred miles to the city trauma hospital, but he had family ties in the area. And then, far in the distance, my now recovered hearing detected a hunting. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Absolutely astonishing writing there by the wonderful Michael Lockhart. Absolutely beautiful, wonderful stuff. Thank you so much, Michael, for penning that one so quick and getting it over to us so soon. And I know you're working on so many other side projects as well. I'm equally excited about all of those and what we have discussed. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And of course, why not hashtag Team Fear. As ever guys, I hope you're all well and happy. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.